everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Facebook live chat. We will be hosting these sessions every Friday at 10 a.m. to discuss some of the common themes caregivers are experiencing through this pandemic. Today, we are spending about 20 to 30 minutes on the topic of safety, and we invite you to ask questions in the comment section of this video, and we'll do our best to answer as we go. My name is Miranda, and I am one of the registered social workers on the Society Support Team. Hi everyone, I am Cindy Bond. I'm the Community Education Specialist with the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. Thanks for joining us this morning. Yes, yeah, so I'm just gonna take a moment here and pull up the questions um, so that we can, can answer as we yeah. go. This is a very common theme this week, wouldn't you say, Cindy? It is, it's <laughs> very common. Um, I think primarily because we've had more calls from caregivers um, with concerns about safety. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are, um, outside of a pandemic, there are always safety concerns to be aware of and cognizant of, but I think there's new safety concerns with this pandemic that are a little bit different than what people have seen in the past. So, for example, uh, one of the biggest ones I'm hearing is that there maybe the person living with dementia wants to go outside as frequently as they did before, go to the grocery shop three times a week, when, of course, we all know it's been advised to limit that um, exposure to public, right, and practice that yes. safe, uh, social distancing. Mm -hmm. So that's been probably one of the bigger themes that I'm hearing from caregivers is that challenge on how do I keep my person inside when they maybe don't remember or don't understand what's going on in society right now. Right. Yeah, we're hearing that. And um, I think this week, um, our colleague Padma Ganesh had a webinar on or um, a Facebook chat, actually, with a specialist talking about safety. And I too did a webinar on Wednesday about safety. So yeah, there are concerns due to memory loss and those changes that happen, um, which are common, right? Yeah, it's like, how do I cue my person to stay six feet away from other people um, and wash their hands and, and just be conscious of that, which is hard with memory loss. Right, exactly. So yeah. I think one of the things that I've been really encouraging is just for caregivers to do the best that they can, right? So there's a lot of things we can't control. So control the things that you can, right? Which we talked about a little bit last week when we went over managing expectations. So for example, if you can't get your person to wear a mask or you do need to go outside even just for a walk once a day to get out of the house, See if you can encourage your person to wash their hands appropriately. Do that with them. Right? Maybe have some posters, which we've recently posted on our Facebook page. So you can print out some posters about how to wash your hands as a visual cue. Yeah. What else would you say around controlling some of the things you can control? Yeah, uh, I think um, if someone wants to go outside, by all means, go outside. Uh, maybe it's in the backyard or um, having a purposeful walk saying, let's walk on this walkway. Um, so there's less interaction. Your, your person is more likely just to walk by somebody than engage maybe in a conversation in closer proximity, which as a caregiver might make you a little bit nervous. Right, right. I do like the idea of going outside, maybe sitting on a patio if possible, especially as the weather gets nicer, right? Everybody wants to yeah. be outside in the sun. So that's a really great idea. Hopefully if your person can get outside, maybe do some gardening and other purposeful activities that mm -hmm. design out and about will be lessened. Yeah. And definitely planning ahead of time for those things. So I know a friend of mine, uh, her and I went for a hike and we left really early just to avoid crowds and things like that. So by the time we got back to our vehicle, the parking lot was packed, but we hardly saw anyone on the trail. So just planning ahead um, right. can be helpful. Yeah, 
Well, and even having some activities for rainy days or maybe days where the caregiver just doesn't want to be going out. It's, you know, they've gone out every other day and need a day in, inside the house. Uh, the dollar store has some really great items that you can pick up and try and keep your person engaged and inside the home. Yeah. And the use of technology as well is great for rainy days. Um, uh, you know, staying, we've talked about this too, uh, using iPads and Zoom and uh, Facebook chat and stuff like that. But I think technology too, if your person um, is able to go safely out on their own for a walk, um, then there's a lots of technology options out there to keep them safe. Um, it, there's lots of technology out there. So in fact, Miranda and I are going to dive into technology a lot more in depth next week. But yeah, uh, there's GPS, there's um, GPS on iPhones. Uh, there's all kinds of things out there. Yeah, absolutely. And there's other cues that can help a person living with dementia that, um, aside from technology, right? So maybe you're removing shoes and um, other items that your person would grab to go outside away from the front door, right? Um, or putting bells on the door so that you know when you're leaving the house. Yes. Ideas there can be triggers for wanting that person wanting to leave the home as well, like you're saying, right? Seeing a person a hallway near the doorway, so eliminating that. Um, also, you know, time of day, maybe they see that the sun, it's getting a little darker. Um, so, you know, closing curtains and turning on lights to avoid those triggers of going home sometimes, a person with dementia will say, around four or five o'clock, even later now, because um, we have more daylight hours that they want to go home or they want to leave. So that right. trigger as well. Absolutely. That's great. So like Cindy said, we do have um, two other videos around safety, specifically on this topic of um, safety for the kids or for the person living with dementia. Mm -hmm just in direct relation to COVID-19. Um, but there's yeah. some other emerging themes that we're seeing around safety. And it's uh, maybe more about the caregiver that I'd really like to talk about. Yeah, so, I think that's great, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm hearing a lot about is um, some aggressive behaviors from the person living with dementia towards their care partner. And aggressive behaviors, although they're not the norm, this pandemic seems to really be a trigger for some of those responsive behaviors. And I, we will refer to them as responsive behaviors because that's really what it is. It's the person living with dementia responding to brain changes, changes in the environment, stresses, emotions, unmet needs right, when maybe they don't have another way to express that appropriately or lack the communication skills to do that. Right. So it's, yeah, so we're switching focus. Um, like Miranda said, we've talked a lot about safety previously this week. So we want to focus now on the caregiver's safety um, and, and keeping them safe during those times when they are seeing those responsive behaviors. So Miranda, what would you suggest, what, what would be some things that you would suggest to a caregiver in the event, air quotes, in the event that they feel unsafe because of their person's behavior? Right. So when I get these calls, what I, what I do with the caregiver is really develop what's called a safety plan, right? So it's just some ideas to have um, in the back of your mind, ready to go if there were a situation where the caregiver was feeling unsafe in any way, right? And uh, responsive behavior can be verbal or it can be physical, right? It can be emotional. So that's really up to the caregiver what they feel unsafe, right? Or when they feel unsafe. So yeah. the first thing I would always ask is, do you have a place to go, right? Maybe a neighbor that is, 
a little bit aware of what's going on for you and your person, um, a family member close by, that would be the first one is if you feel unsafe, first thing you do is get out of that house. Yes, because you yourself as a caregiver might be um, a trigger in that moment and, and try not to take that personally, but it, it can happen. Um, and just removing yourself out of sight, out of mind, going outside, walking around the house. No two situations are the same. Um, I like Miranda that you said it's how the caregiver is feeling and really about safety it's a lot about gut feeling I think caregivers know their person better than anyone else and it's just you know you feel that uneasiness listen to it and just out of sight out of mind just you know it might be as simple as that and then coming back in and the situation is diffused so all right um, and that's just it. The caregiver is the expert in the situation, right? You know yeah. your person um, the best and you have to do what feels right for you, right? Yes. If possible, if possible in the first, you know, if you can tell your person starting to escalate, they're getting agitated, that might be a time to try and intervene. And Cindy, I think you had a really great point about this. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a common theme around behavior escalation. So the first stage, if you will, um, and think of this as an escalation, behavior escalation. So if, if I had a graph, this is what it would look like. So when a person moves from their baseline, and again, the caregiver knows what is normal for that person. When they start moving from their baseline, to showing signs of anxiety. So that's the next stage. So from baseline to anxiety, some, some anxious feelings, it could be wringing their hands, it could be pacing, it could be even a repetitive vocalization. Um, it could, yeah, it could look different for a lot of people, but they're moving away from that baseline. That's the important part. So. Baseline anxiety. The next one is verbal. So um, this, you know, a verbalization that indicates that they are anxious. Right. So that's typically this, the third. Um, keeping in mind that all these points of escalation, a caregiver can potentially, potentially underscore um, change the outcome or intervene. So it doesn't escalate to the next stage, which goes from verbal to potentially physical. So physical can look different. It could be actually hitting the caregiver. It could be throwing something at the caregiver. It could be throwing something at the Not wall, happening. right? Not hitting the wall, but there's definitely some physical things that are occurring. Um, and then it's important, I think, to note that after physical, there's a time of recovery as well. When a person has expressed their feelings verbally, physically, and then a time where they actually might be quite tired um, and not necessarily ready to talk right away. But it's, a, again, no two people are the same. But for some, they need that opportunity just to collect themselves. And that's going to look like a different time frame for everyone. And then uh, a time to talk about what had happened, what upset you. I'm so sorry. So communication is becomes really important at all those stages of behavioral escalation. Yeah, and I think another point to add on to that is sometimes, depending on the situation, um, maybe there was some sort of escalation maybe at night or before the person took a nap. Oftentimes I talk to people who or caregivers rather who they have left a situation and when they return, their person has no recollection that anything has happened. Right. So yeah. it is a bit of trying not to take that fight personally even <laughs> with someone that you love yes. and that has powers over your emotions to some degree. Right? Sure. 
I think it's important to note, even for professionals who do this for a living, despite your best intention and doing everything perfect, it can still lead to a physical expression um, that is very concerning for um, the caregiver. So because of changes you talked about earlier, right, the brain changes and, and there's so many variables to emotions as well that, yeah, caregivers have to try not to take that personally. Yeah. It's hard, but yeah. Absolutely. I think it's important too, though, Miranda, is to, you know, we talk about caregivers learning about the disease, learning what's normal, um, and definitely communication is key in dementia care. Um, it's really that foundation um, for uh, combating, if you will, it gives you the tools you need to help in behavior escalation. Right. And I really like what you said about you can use every strategy in your tool belt, every strategy that's worked in the past, and they still may not be successful, right? What works one day may not work the next. And even more so what works five minutes ago may not work now. Yes. I think that's why having a safety plan is really, really important, um, especially if your person has a history of responsive behaviors. So aside from a place to go, a, a plan of action of where you can leave to get out of the house, um, some other ideas would be to make sure that you have a cell phone on you. If possible, that's charged at all times, right? Again, getting out of the house first, um, but you want to be able to call somebody, right? Um, and that's going to look different depending on the situation. Uh, maybe you're, you need to just talk to a friend or a family member about the difficult time and help you relax and um, adjust to what's just happened. Um, or maybe it's a more severe situation where you think you need to phone emergency services, um, and calling emergency services is um, not uncommon in these situations. Typically, they'll send over police or another team to the home just to talk to each person individually and see what's going on. Um, and sometimes that is needed for to help de-escalate a situation. Right? Um, Cindy, I believe you had looked into some of the other teams that may be involved in um, yeah. severe I think. <clears throat> yeah, there's definitely things to consider. Number one is the safety of the caregiver. Um, you know, that self-care component to the situation, listening to your gut and not being afraid to ask for help. So like Miranda said, if there's a history, um, then long term, you, you really need to connect with uh, professionals to keep yourself safe in the long run. That being said, Miranda, I love, don't hesitate, call 911. It's not like you see on TV where the SWAT team <laughs> propels in, um, the neighbors are out because they see what's going on, right? Um, it's not that dramatic. Um, police are trained, CPS is trained. Um, they ask questions, they're, typically gentle in their approach. And like you said, Miranda, they want to assess the situation. Yeah. Another um, option for caregivers as well is to call the distress center. And I, I'll share that number a couple times if that's okay. It's the distress center is 403-266-4357. And you can request mobile response team, MRT. Now, if, if you're viewing this and you forget, don't worry, we're a phone call away. Um, so all the social workers are well aware of this. So what MRT can do, they're, first of all, they're social workers, psychologists, and nurses. They come in a nondescript vehicle. So, it, you know, for caregivers that, might find that embarrassing. It's a normal car, normal people dressed in street clothing, get out. They come in and they really, the caregiver really decides with some education and explanation how they want to proceed. So 
they MRT can offer crisis intervention and crisis stabilization, which I really like. So like Miranda said earlier, that diffusing of the situation. Um, they also do urgent psychiatric assessments. This is right off their website, by the way, trauma response. So as a caregiver, it, you can be shaken emotionally by what's yeah. happening. So I like that. Mental health education as, as well. Uh, professional consultation so that and they help hook you up to what might benefit you and of right. course um, if you have concerns in the long term they will meet you in community I understand as well so I think that's a really valuable resource for caregivers as well now in the moment you don't have time it's like what is the number to the distress center um, you could certainly put it in your phone so you have easy access to the distress center, but 911, don't hesitate to call as well. Absolutely. That reminds me, Miranda, I have a, a friend back in Ontario and he had behaviors um, that escalated to physical as well. And just having police come kind of, ooh, Wow, I really solidified and drove home the message that his behavior was not appropriate. Yeah, well, and I think and it, was, it was really impactful for him. Right. Most people are raised to respect authority, right? Doctors, police. So having that kind of intervention can make a real difference. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that although um, anxiety and physical expressions of emotion <laughs> or responsive behaviors mm -hmm. um, are, are, are normal for the person living with dementia. But as a person not living with dementia, it's okay to say that this behavior is not okay. And I'm not going to put up with it like you would in any domestic violence situation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah self-help and the person is key. Right. Depending what's happening for the person living with dementia, they may need that verbal cue that this is not appropriate, right? They may not maybe be aware of what they're doing or have any insight to the idea that their behavior is not acceptable. So it's okay. You're right to say, this is not acceptable. You need to stop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know um, another idea around the safety plan for a caregiver, sometimes depending where your person is in their journey, you may be able to leave them alone mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. So it might be a good idea to have a grab bag with some extra clothes, maybe a phone charger, any other necessities and have that ready to go maybe in your car or by the door. And if you have a place maybe as a sibling or a child's house that you can stay at for the night, that might help as well, just de-escalate and give you as the caregiver a chance to relax, breathe, and kind of recuperate from that situation. I really like the idea of that go bag um, because I've heard from caregivers, it gives them reassurance mm -hmm. to know that they have a plan ahead of time and all those things like, um, maybe extra medications yeah. in the go bag, an extra phone charger, um, some cash maybe. Yeah, all great a ideas. Set of clothing. Um, but I like Miranda where you said, you know, sometimes you can go to family and, and just de-escalate out of sight, out of mind kind of thing as well. We've heard caregivers doing that. Um, but an interesting thing as well is sometimes I've heard caregivers say, my daughter or my son can just, a phone call from them just so changes the script of what's happening. So yeah. caregivers say they go into the bathroom, say, you know, call their daughter. <laughs> yeah. Dad right now. <laughs> yeah. And I said that. Yeah, I've heard that situation many times. There's often somebody in the family or maybe a close friend that 
the person living with dementia just seems to kind of listen to or maybe respect in a certain way. And if it's safe, if it's safe to call them and see if that kind of intervention can help that is sometimes quite successful. Yeah. I think it goes back to uh, the caregiver listening to their gut and not ignoring that and not minimizing it. So what if uh, you call 911 and by the time the police get there, your person is, you know, forgetting what had happened and is watching TV and having their lunch. It, in the moment, um, don't hesitate. I, I think that's important. Listen to your gut as a caregiver. If you're scared, that's not okay. It's really not. No, absolutely. Well, and the other thing along with, you know your person, right? So especially if there's a history of some responsive behaviors, it may be taking precautions, right? Um, locking up sharp objects, medicine, cleaning products, um, so that if a situation escalates, there's no really, hopefully, harm that can be done from those types of objects. Um, that being said, if that is where your mind is, if your mind is that I need to lock up items because I'm scared for my safety, it may be time to talk to a social worker or your doctor or another medical professional about a more long-term safety plan, right? Um, and more long-term plan for what your living situation might look like. Yeah, exactly. I know there's like, there's a plethora of, of tips out there, you know, keep your back to an open doorway. So you have a, a, a way of leaving the situation. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if behavior is starting to escalate, going from anxiety to verbal, get out of the kitchen. There's so many things to throw in the kitchen. Yeah. So many things, right? If you move to the living room, you might get hit by a pillow. Um, uh, but I really like Miranda that if your mind is going there, talk to somebody. Yeah, because again, despite all those tips, if you're living in fear, that's not okay. It's really not okay. Caregivers deserve the best quality of life possible. Um, and this certainly is no exception. Absolutely. Well, we are getting towards the end of our time here. Uh, no questions today, but that's okay. If anybody watching has any questions that are maybe a little bit too personal to post onto Facebook, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Great. And I just want to give that distress number again, if I may. It's 403-266-4357. And we'll put that in the comments. Yeah. The and I have, oh, MRT, uh, they have hours. So the mobile response unit can be accessed only through the distress center. They field those calls. Um, but the MRT is from 9.30 to 9.30, they work. 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m., which I, um, Monday through uh, Sunday. They're open all week and including statutory holidays. So that can be a really good resource for caregivers as well. Absolutely, yeah. We'll put that information in the comment section for um, reference. Yeah. So I wanna thank, I think that wraps it up, eh, Miranda? I think so, yeah. We'll talk more um, about safety next week though. <laughs> it's such a big topic that we could spend all day. Um, and I hope that the viewers appreciate that we, we have those videos. Um, we have the professional chat with Padma Ganesh on our Facebook as well. Um, so please check that out. We also have a safety webinar. We'll probably be offering again in June. We're almost, we're at the end of May. I can't believe that. Um, so yeah, sign up for that as well. And thank you for watching. Uh, next week's topic will be technology. So yeah. technology primarily around safety, right? Um, and keeping connected. 
Uh, you can speak to a social worker one on one at 403 290 0110 or send an email to info at alzheimercalgary.ca or chat live with our social worker on our website, which is www.alzheimercalgary.ca. And if you like this, please like and share. Um, and please, if you watch this afterwards, if you have any questions, we'll do our best to answer them and, and keep an eye, maybe not on the weekend, but hang on to those numbers we gave you and those resources. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.